time once again for Community Forum. And we're very lucky to have back with us live in the studios, Tom Carpenter. Tom Carpenter is the executive director of the Hanford Challenge. He worked as the director of the Nuclear Oversight Campaign for the Government Accountability Project from 1985 to 2007. He also founded the Cincinnati Alliance for Responsible Energy, also known as CARE, which challenged plans to open the defect-ridden Zimmer nuclear power plant. He also helped establish and is a board member of the Hanford Concerns Council and its predecessor, the Hanford Joint Council, and is a former member of the Hanford Advisory Board. Tom, thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us again. Sure. Thanks for having me. Good to be here, Mike. So start out. Tell us a bit about the Hanford Challenge. Sure. Well, uh, Hanford Challenge is a... uh, uh, it's based here in Washington State, and its mission is uh, to oversee the cleanup of the Hanford nuclear site. Uh, Hanford nuclear site is uh, one of the is the nation's most contaminated nuclear facility, resulting from the production of nuclear weapons materials, particularly plutonium. It's about 200 miles from Seattle uh, in the eastern part of the state, southeastern part in the Tri Cities area, and uh, this facility shut down for making plutonium. Uh, back in the late 1980s uh, and since then has been in cleanup mode Um, and uh, people tend to think that it's over right you know we quit making plutonium there but there's a long you know many decades left um, uh, to you know clean up the the aftermath of of a big nuclear party that happened in southeastern Washington Uh, and you know that that party left behind uh, just a uh, unimaginable amount of nuclear waste. Uh, most of it stored in the soil. Uh, a lot of it went into the river, into the air, and whatnot. And so it's 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 taking quite a bit of our time and money as a society to uh, deal with the uh, the nuclear waste issues and the leftovers from the Hanford site. Uh, and it's not going so well. Thus, you have to have some public oversight, and that's what the Hanford Challenge is there to do. We we tend to work with whistleblowers, people who work at the site. Uh, we educate the public. Uh, we pay very, very close attention to, on a daily basis, to what's happening at the Hanford site, which, which is a massive undertaking. It's you know it's costing billions of dollars a year, um, and there's 11,000 people uh, who are employed there, and uh, so that's uh, that's our mission: is to get on top of this cleanup, trying to influence it to go into the right direction. Uh, sometimes with lawsuits, sometimes with uh, participation in, in forums and whatnot. But that's uh, uh, that's what Hanford Challenge does. All right. Well, speaking of massive undertakings, uh, one of the, the the main project there now appears to be the waste treatment plant. Can right. You talk about that. Sure. Um, you know, uh, Hanford, if uh, it had nine reactors uh to make the plutonium and then five large reprocessing facilities and literally hundreds of other facilities laboratories and you know uh etc to uh, assist in the mission of making that plutonium and to make the plutonium you fission uranium uh you irradiate uranium in other targets uh so-called and you transmute that uranium to make plutonium but that unfortunately makes a lot of other radioactive materials as well so the purpose of Hanford was to separate out through chemical processes, uh, you know, melting the fuels and acid and whatnot, dissolving, uh, to get that little speck of plutonium out of this huge mass of nuclear waste, basically, nuclear fuels. But the rest of it had to be disposed of as waste. And the vast majority of that went uh, as liquid waste discharges into the soil, uh, but uh, the worst of it went into underground nuclear waste tanks. And a lot of people here that have lived in Seattle and the state of Washington have heard of the Hanford nuclear waste tanks. Um, and these are underground waste tanks. There's 177 of these tanks that were largely built in the 50s and 60s, or 40s and 50s. Um, 129, 167 single shell tanks made of carbon steel. Half of those have failed uh, and have leaked a million gallons into the soil or more. Um, some people say six million gallons. We really don't know. And then in the 1970s and 80s, uh, another 28 double shell tanks were built. Again, all of these tanks are, are under the ground. Uh, it's You can't inspect the tanks easily because of that. Uh, but the, also, uh, the waste, when it leaks, goes straight into the 
the soil beneath the tanks and, and then into the groundwater below the tanks, which is anywhere from 120 to 180 feet below the surface. So um, this is the big problem at Hanford is, you know, this highly concentrated brew of radioactive materials mixed with chemicals. It's hot. It's dangerous in, in extremely tiny, tiny little quantities, um, you know, molecular level. It's lethal, and it will be lethal and um, a problem for the foreseeable future, right? I mean, it's for many, many generations. Some of these radionuclides are dangerous for millions of years. Uh, and some of them are dangerous for the next several hundred years. Um, so the, the task at Hanford is largely to um, remove the waste from these tanks, which again, have many have failed. All of them will fail. They weren't designed to last you know, for a long time. They were temporary holding tanks made of carbon steel. Uh, most of them have one, one wall as opposed to a double walled tank. And uh, so when they do fail, it just goes into the environment. Uh, so, uh, and none of them were uh, meant to last as long as they have. Many of them were built to last 20 years. Uh, and so that, that expired right in the 1960s, right around the time when we put uh, a man on the moon. So here we are 50 years later still using these tanks and uh, the waste treatment plant is supposed to be the plant where you treat the waste in the tanks, to remove the waste from the tanks, to mix it with molten glass, let that glass, um, you know, put, put that molten glass in, a, uh, in steel tubes and canisters, it cools, and then the, um, uh, the, the waste becomes part of the matrix of the glass. And then you can store that, that radioactive glass deep underground and let it decay away. So that's the theory. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to accomplish this at Hanford. This is, we're on our fourth or fifth, depending on how you count, uh, attempt to build uh, a treatment system for this Hanford tank waste. Uh, we've been trying since 19, the 1990s. Uh, Hanford has, has come up with various schemes that have been canceled. The latest scheme started in 2000, and um, it, it got pretty far down the road. Uh, we've you know, they, they got to a point where 75% of the plant was built, you know, and 99% of it designed. However, uh, they were using something called fast track, uh, where they were designing a little bit and building a little bit. And, you know, that might be okay for, a, you know, something like a car uh, assembly plant where you've done it many times, but for a nuclear waste facility, one of a kind, you've never done it before, um, it, it was a bad idea, and uh, that was said at the, at the time, but that wasn't listened to. Um, the worst thing, though, was uh, apart from that and, and being then surprised uh, about, you know, things they didn't know in the design not being able to handle that problem, uh, you know, there were also problems with their following the, the rules, uh, the nuclear safety laws and whatnot. And so now we've got a facility that whose quality is indeterminate, meaning we don't know about, we can't certify the, uh, the safety and the reliability of the parts used to build this plant. Uh, the design is insufficient. Uh, uh, they admit at this point, and this started with whistleblowers pointing this out, that uh, if you use this plant as designed, then you probably won't be able to sufficiently mix the waste to prevent an explosion because of hydrogen gas buildup or nuclear criticality, uh, AKA a very bad day in the nuclear industry when you have an unplanned nuclear criticality. So those safety and technical issues have resulted in, uh, you know, suspending all work on the plant. Um, and the planned opening date of 2019 is certainly not gonna be met at this point. Um, the state of Washington is very upset about this. It's a regulator at the site. It's filed litigation in the past to try to get the Hanford site, which is owned by the federal government, uh, to uh, meet its cleanup deadlines and to get this place under control. Um, it, just uh, five years ago, the, uh, the Department of Energy, the federal government, and the state of Washington and the EPA signed a new agreement committing to a new set of deadlines, which was 2019, because the plant was supposed to be opening in 2009. So they, they booted it out another 10 years, 
Uh, and it wasn't very much longer after that, a, a couple of years later, that the DOE admitted, well, we probably won't make the new deadlines either. Well, last, uh, last fall, the, when the state filed its lawsuit, the, the position of the federal government in court is we don't know when this plant will open, uh, so we don't have a schedule, we don't have a cost estimate, uh, so go away, leave us alone, we'll tell you when uh, we're ready to commit to a deadline. Uh, and meanwhile, um, you know, they've got a, uh, some workarounds that they're planning to put in. They want to build a new kind of facility off to the side to do some of the functions of pre-treating this waste. And um, Hanford is very fond of acronyms, right? So one of the acronyms for this plant was called DFLAW. And it was like, no, you did not name it DFLAW. But yes, they did. And that stands for Direct Feed Low Activity Waste. And this was a facility to separate out some of the higher radiation emitting radionuclides to, so they could at least use the low activity waste melter, right? It wasn't as heavily shielded, but there's more of them. And maybe get some waste, you know, at an earlier time into glass. Uh, and, and that's the name of the game is getting the waste out of the tanks into a glass form. And we agree with that. We want that to happen. That's a good idea. Um, as, as, and everyone thinks that's a good idea. It's just accomplishing that. It's going to be much, much harder. Um, about six weeks ago, uh, an investigative arm uh, of a government agency, uh, the GAO, came in and kind of rained on their parade out there and said, well, this, this DFLAW plant, this direct feed law, is riddled with safety defects. Uh, it's riddled with um, design problems. Uh, it's not going to open on time uh, when you think it's going to open. It's not going to cost what you think it's going to cost. It's going to be a lot more. And the low activity melter uh, is not immune from the other problems with the, the safety issues. Uh, so now Congress is kind of sitting back going, wow, what are we spending all this money on? Right? So there are questions starting to be raised um, about, well, what's the plan B for the waste treatment plant, uh, which is we've been here before. Uh, and so we're, it's, um, we've got a crisis with the tanks. We do have to treat the waste. Uh, we just wonder whether or not the right people are in place to make this happen, right? Uh, can they do it? Can the Department of Energy, is it the right agency? Uh, is this the right set of contractors to accomplish this mission? Because uh, so far we've been met with very expensive failures. Well, you just touched on it uh, briefly, but the the materials they're using to build these facilities are turns out are subpar well right so the uh <clears throat> in order to you know kind of i guess save money uh and and sh go faster um materials were procured not you know not using a uh a quality control quality assurance system so what that means is that you know every nuclear facility you have to have a, a pump or or steel or concrete that's been inspected and certified and designed to operate in the rigorous environment of a, of a chemical processing plant, you know, in a nuclear facility. Uh, it's got to work when there's an earthquake. It's got to work when there's a fire, an explosion. So these pumps, for instance, let's take it's a pump, um, they have to be examined and designed to withstand that and then, <clears throat> you know, built of the right quality metals, um, then inspected and tested. So you can't just go to, you know, Home Depot and pick up a pump and stick it in your nuclear plant. You know, it has plastic parts in it that will fail, et cetera. Well, um, you know, Hanford, uh, you know, the contractor out there seems to have done, they didn't buy it from, from Home Depot, but, you know, they, they had equipment put in that was not meeting the codes uh, where, um, you know, they, they didn't have the quality control required programs in place so that, the pedigree isn't there to prove that they've got the right equipment there. So the pedigree is just like if you have a, a purebred dog, right, then it certifies, yes, here's the lineage, you know, you can go check the records, et cetera. It's the same with a pump, you know, or a pipe at the plant is you can go, you know, look at the records and see where the metal from the pipe came from, you know, who did the work on it, uh, whether there was an x-ray. Uh, none of that's there uh, in some cases, and that's a real concern because that's a quality indeterminate facility. You can't open it. The law requires that you have to either tear that out, you know, or abandon the facility. You can't use it as a nuclear plant. 
And this has happened in the commercial industry over and over again, right? It's, uh, um, you know, this was the downfall of some plants in the, in the nuclear industry. And we know how important it is after Three Mile Island, after Fukushima, after uh, Chernobyl, that you can't risk a nuclear accident. The pumps have to work, the electrical switches have to work, and if they don't, uh, you're risking a catastrophe that threatens a large area of land with permanent, um, you know, catastrophe. Well, you mentioned having the right people in place is critical to these projects uh, actually working and protecting us all. And there have been numerous people out there who were the right people, but when they came forward and pointed out the gross errors and problems with this facility, they were punished and fired. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing because uh, if you look at the people who have spoken out and then gotten fired, uh, it's, uh, it's their top tier technical staff, right? So we're talking the manager of research and technology who, uh, PhD, 40 years in the industry, Dr. Walter Tamasitis, uh, and uh, untouchable guy, right? I mean, this guy is top of his, at the top of his game, and his job was to research and find out and fix technical issues. And uh, it came to a point where uh, the plant was not able to, you know, tackle these problems. There were just inherent design issues. That's not his, it wasn't his job to design it. It was his job to find the technical issues. Uh, and uh, the day came when they said, okay, well, we're ready to, you know, close the design and pivot to construction and commissioning, right? Because, well, wait a second, you've got about 50 huge issues, including insufficient mixing of the waste that could result in the production of hydrogen gas, which could cause an explosion and nuclear criticalities and, and other issues like that. He had big, big issues, not, not little ones. Um, and the next day he was uh, essentially marched out of the, the building and his badge and his phone was taken away. He was um, assigned a basement office. Uh, he then subsequently met with the uh, Secretary of Energy uh, at the behest of Senator Wyden, and a few months later was fired. Um, so that, that firing happened about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, another one was Donna Bushy, and Donna Bushy was the manager of nuclear safety. So again, she was hired to oversee the safety issues at the site, and uh, she worked for the waste treatment plant, was employed by a company called URS, and she, when Walt got fired, um, you know, she was kind of drawn into that, right, and testified not only in his lawsuit uh, because she was, you know, deposed, but went, went beyond that and went to uh, a safety oversight board and testified about the safety issues, which they subsequently issued a report on, which led to the report, the whole plant being suspended. So there's no doubt right now that everything that Donna said and everything that Walt said and uh, another guy named Gary Brunson, he was the chief engineer for the facility, the chief scientist became a whistleblower, uh, etc. All these people paid, uh, you know, a price with being harassed, being isolated, being fired. Um, the, the chief scientist, uh, you know, was transferred away. Uh, the chief engineer uh, was forced out of his job. Uh, and then there's a whole kind of a um, bunch of people who were engineers and whatnot who who left uh, either get, couldn't take it anymore, you know, et cetera. So th this retaliation, uh, it's called the safety culture, right? It's are you do people feel comfortable in raising concerns? And this has been studied now, and, and surveys have been done by the government, by the Department of Energy itself, and by other agencies, and found that most people or a good number of people are fearful of raising issues uh, and uh, well duh yeah all these people have been fired around you and they look to be very important people whose job it was to report safety issues of course you're going to keep your mouth shut uh, and let you know let someone else raise a concern maybe um, so uh, they've got a long way to go and that's part of the part of the problem out there is you know, a nuclear facility ought to be welcoming the uh, identification of problems. Why? So you can go fix them, right? If you have people unwilling or afraid 
to raise an, an issue, then it doesn't get raised, maybe, and it doesn't get fixed. Then the plan opens and you've got a catastrophe or a loss of life or an injury, you know, or the plant just simply breaks and you can't, it's very expensive to fix it. I mean, there's all, all the things that could happen, uh, which is why you have uh, uh, in, in the commercial industry, which is far, far from perfect, but they've got rules that would send people to jail for harassing a quality inspector, for instance. Uh, big fines. Uh, there's accountability mechanisms. The, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which does not have oversight of this facility, but does over the commercial plants, can actually ban a manager or a foreman for life um, from working in the industry uh, because they because they harassed a whistleblower, right? But the Department of Energy has nothing like that. In fact, the people who harass whistleblowers seem to be the ones that get bonuses, you know, who are there year after year. While the people who raise the issues, you know, are stuck on the outside now, having to get lawyers and, and fight like hell to have a career at all anymore, uh, and that's the story of Hanford. Well, that's finally come to the attention of Congress. So Senator Ron Wyden raised this as an issue uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, the Department of Energy has, you know, said, "Well, we want to make Monica Ragalbuto the new Assistant Secretary." as the boss over, over cleanup at, at DOE sites, Department of Energy sites like Hanford. And Senator Wyden was on the committee in the Senate where that confirmation hearing was happening. And he questioned her, he says, well, you know, I've sat in this chair and asked you and asked others in the department for a while about how you treat your whistleblowers. And he pointed out that the Secretary of Energy at his behest met with Walt Tamasitis and Donna Bushy and other whistleblowers who subsequently got fired, and nothing happened, right? The DOE did nothing about the fact that these people were, were terminated. And he goes, I'm sick and tired of it. So he blocked her nomination, said, I'm going to block your nomination until you come back with a plan, until you show me that you're serious about changing the safety culture at the Hanford site and start to show me progress on the waste treatment plant. Um, I don't think they can. I don't think they're capable of it at the Department of Energy. I think they're, uh, you know, just riddled with uh, incompetence and fear, frankly, and that the Congress and the administration need to simply realize that, you know, decade after decade of, of failure in building a system to treat Hanford's waste, et cetera, maybe you need different people in the chair, you know, making the decisions and overseeing the contractors you need a different system and, and you need a change. And it doesn't look like it's going to happen or it's going to come from this set of actors right now. And yeah, there are some good people in that system, but the leadership is, is kind of stuck with a, a very poor, uh, a very poor culture and a very poor system. So, uh, and meanwhile, it's really the public safety at risk here. You know, Hanford, even though it's not producing plutonium, is still a, a, a fantastic and awful safety risk. You know, that uh, you can have fires, you can have releases of radioactive material that can make a three-state area uninhabitable. Uh, you know, it doesn't take much to release that much cesium or strontium-90, you know, from an explosion or an earthquake or whatever that, that causes that release to happen. And once the resource, the rivers, the land, the farms, uh, the people are contaminated, it just is, right? It, you can't just go clean it up. And we know that from other nuclear facility, uh, you know, like Fukushima and Chernobyl, they're essentially permanently uninhabitable around those areas. Uh, we're risking that at Hanford uh, if we're not careful from, uh, from safety problems, uh, like these tanks uh, sitting there with the huge inventory, but it's not the only issue. Those, so those tanks are just a ticking time bomb. I mean, you're looking at well, catastrophic yeah, failure. What, one Washington governor, uh, Gary Locke, famously called those tanks underground Chernobyls. And uh, you know, he got a lot of grief for, for doing that, but uh, I thought he hit the nail on the head. Uh, each tank contains you know, uh, millions of curies of radioactivity. And uh, people don't know what a curie is, but it's a, uh, you know, a millionth or a billionth of that is, is considered, would be a fatal dose. Uh, in many cases, right? So having that much inventory, that much radiation in these tanks is, is, is very alarming and disturbing. And I think future generations will, will look back on this and go, what were they thinking? 
why was this not a priority? Uh, and especially if there is an accident, it's you know the public will be very upset that not more was not done to protect the public from this site. And they're not just leaking into the ground; they're also potential for, as you mentioned already, explosions. Explosions, absolutely. Um, you know, just a few weeks ago, I saw a report that um, you know a test showed that the hydrogen gas had built up within one of the sea farm tanks at the Hanford site to 97 percent of the lower explosive limit. Um, that's alarming. Uh, uh, 97 percent um, is is a very very high figure. Um, you're supposed to. Uh, Hanford is supposed to vent the tank and, and get the hydrogen gas out of there in a compressed space at 25 percent. So, um, you know, how often is that happening? This, you know, in the tanks, it, it might be, you know, every week some tank is reaching that. Hanford doesn't know. It's not routinely monitoring hydrogen gas levels out there. And in fact, like, you know, a few months ago, they, they admitted they didn't check at all, um, you know, for, for a long, long time last year. Uh, this has been a big safety issue um, that the Defense Nuclear Facilities Safety Board and Senator Wyden has raised, uh, and DOE has said, well, okay, well, you know, maybe in 2016 we'll get it fixed. It's like, well, no, this is a crisis, you know, this is, but they, you know, there's, you just wonder about their attitude about safety out there. They say safety is our priority and safety is number one, but they don't act like it. Right. It's it looks like schedule and looking good. Those are their, you know, they want to look like they're doing something and keep the money flowing. Um, you know, I've called Hanford the largest ATM in the desert. Uh, you know, contractors go out there and they're they're withdrawing two billion dollars a year from the federal tax account. Uh, and it doesn't matter that they're showing progress or not. They still get their money every year. And there is some progress happening on cleanup at Hanford. I'm not saying that, but when it comes to the nuclear waste tanks, you know, despite some $20 billion spent on waste treatment, not one drop of nuclear waste from the tanks has been treated or taken care of. $20 billion. And they're poised to spend, you know, how much more? You know, tens of billions of dollars more. And we're not sure that any of it is going to work. Uh, just about a minute left. Uh, can you just give us a really quick update on the exposed workers from the vapor? Sure. Um, yeah, these, these tanks uh, also generate uh, chemicals uh, that emit from the tanks and vapor. It's making workers sick. And there's a, uh, in the last year, about 72 people have gotten severely exposed enough to re require medical evaluation. Uh, a study was done, another study was done, released last October, uh, that said, yep, um, you don't know what you're exposing workers to, at what levels, what health effects you're causing, and you need to step up your game to protect these people. Well, that resulted in the Attorney General of the State of Washington and Hanford Challenge, my, my group and the uh, Pipefitters Union, uh, all filing um, what's called Notice of Intent to Sue, and we're ready to sue them if they don't fix this problem. So stay tuned for that because uh, that's coming up. And um, ju just to let you know, if people are interested in this kind of thing, you know, Hanford Challenge, we're based in Seattle. Uh, we're having an ice cream social uh, in uh, Discovery Park next Friday from 5 to 7. You can come get free ice cream, learn about Hanford, play some games, uh, bring your kids, get face painting done, etc. So it'll be, uh, you know, some music there, Discovery Park, Friday the 17th. So I uh, hope people can make it. All right. And I point out for those that don't know, you, your organization working with the pipe fitters was key in getting those changes at the, getting the state motivated to yeah. jump in. On yeah, that. we're very pleased with uh, uh, this governor's attitude and the attorney general's attitude about Hanford these days. You know, clearly they're uh, they're wanting to see the same kind of changes that the rest of us do. But in this case, uh, uh, the triple up trickle up effect so talking with tom carpenter he is executive director of the hanford challenge and uh your website hanfordchallenge.org yes it is very good yeah well, well visit it all right unfortunately we with that we're out of time i want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us well, again thanks for morning. having me mike it's great